Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement. Coming up on today's show, from youth team to first team, Gow Southgate brings in three more youngsters ahead of Tuesday's prestige friendly with Brazil. David Moyes, he's promising some tough love at West Ham, but can he keep them in the Premier League? And what of Michael Emanalo's legacy at Chelsea? Can he really take credit for a decade of success at Stamford Bridge? OK, we've got three guests to answer all those questions and much more this morning. Sam Wallace is the chief football writer for The Telegraph. We've got a debut for the Brazilian journalist Natalie Jedra. And Matt Lawton makes a long way to return to the table. He's the chief sports reporter at the Mail. Morning, guys. Good to see you. Um, don't forget, you can tweet the show at Sunday Sup. The best will appear on the screen over the next 90 minutes. Just try and keep them short and sweet so we can fit them onto the screen. The new 280 characters might cause us a problem. OK, let's have a look at the uh, back pages of the papers this morning. This is the Sunday Express. England scare us. This is Lothar Matthäus, a World Cup winner himself with Germany. He says the new players in Gareth Southgate's squad can cause problems at the World Cup next summer. They're about to take on these boys on Tuesday, the boys from Brazil. That's the front page of the Sunday Express football pullout this morning. Neymar and co, they're in town at Wembley on Tuesday night. Sam's paper, the Sunday Telegraph. Jeremy Wilson with this story. Footballers' families set up a brain bank uh, to fight the dementia crisis. Sam's also been writing about the three players, the three young players that Gareth Southgate from the under-20 squad, the successful under-20 squad, that have been called up for that game against Brazil on Tuesday. One of them... Um, the headline in the Suns goals pull out uh, is Jack the Lad, this man Lewis Cook. He's been learning from Jack Wilshere last season when he was on loan at Bournemouth. He's in the England squad to face Brazil. This man isn't Danny Drinkwater. He's snub. He's not happy um, with um, the media, I think, for their projection. And uh, after he was, uh, after he decided he didn't want to be in the England squad for the games against Germany and Brazil, uh, get him tied down. Not sure about the headline in the people, but Raheem Sterling about to get a new contract at Manchester City. A man with a contract until the end of the season. Uh, a lot of love on the table here, Matt Lawton and Jonathan Northcroft. David Moyes, he's back in business with West Ham, certainly until the end of the season. Uh, the star, you've no chance, Emery Chan, came on as a substitute for Germany on Friday night um, against England. He's on his way out of Liverpool, could go to Manchester City. And uh, a more sobering story from Adam Crafton, and it's an excellent read this morning in the Mail on Sunday, and we'll ask Natalie about it a bit later. This is the uh, Chapecoense tragedy, one year on from the Brazilian air disaster. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. It's an excellent read uh, by Adam uh, this morning in the Mail on Sunday. But first up, we're going to talk England-Germany. Um, the highlights, uh, Sam, what, uh, what did you think of the game? Because we got excited about the performance of Loftus-Cheek, of uh, uh, Jordan Pickford, of course, on his debut. A couple of other debuts sprinkled around for Jack Cork as well, of course, uh, Joe Gomez. But uh, what impressed you, Sam? Well, I think we're starting with Ruben Loftus-Cheek. Yep. He's a player that... He, He's been on the kind of radar for years, really. He's, his name has always been mentioned coming through the ranks of Chelsea. And he's taken, as they tend to now, it's very few teenagers to get into Premier League teams. He's, he's 21 years old. He's unusual at Chelsea in that he's, he's, this season is the first time that he's been out on loan. He's at Palace. Mm -hmm. um, but he's just such an interesting footballer. I mean, he obviously at first appearances, he looks like a real kind of um, a sort of uh, a big strong player who's going to knock people off the ball and tackle, but that's not his game at all. He's very powerful when he's got it and he shields the ball beautifully, but he's got two really quick feet. Um, he, he likes to pass over the top quickly, but there were some beautiful bits of skill. I, I can't think of a single England debut that's begun with someone executing a perfect double nutmeg on <laughs> two, two, you know, two opponents within about three seconds of each other. So. He's a, he's a really silky footballer, and I can't really... I, I, I realise that I'm waxing rather too lyrical about him and, uh, but, uh, after one game, but I just think he's, he's a sort of player that we don't see very often. Mm -hmm. um, that, that kind of great technique allied with the power that he's got as well. Um, he's been criticised in the past because he's, he's quite sort of... He, he's not one for the pro zone status. He doesn't move around the pitch frantically, uh, but he kind of waits for his opportunity to get the ball, and when he's got it, he keeps it, which yep. is... Such an important thing. So I just, uh, obviously, uh, Pickford had a good game as well. A couple of really good saves. Joe Gomez came on early and, and Jack Cork did a bit. So I think it was positive and I think there's a real appetite from England fans to see, see young players. They want to see them and they will give them a chance. They really will. And Loftus cheat took his. He really looked the part. Mm. Were you impressed with the outlook? I know you wrote about um, Loftus Cheek in your piece on Saturday morning, Matt, mm. but the outlook of the team. Matt, uh, Sam mentioned the, the sort of fresh young players, the new players that England supporters want to see. Yeah, and I, I, I sort of I find myself admiring what Gareth is doing at the moment because he, 
you know, he was quite sort of pragmatic in, in how he finished off the qualification campaign. And then immediately he's, he's torn up the whole, the whole sort of blueprint. Started again, new system, new players. Um, I thought he's, the way he's just dropped Chris Smalling, it was brutal. But then when you see the defender, when you see Maguire and Stones playing the way they're playing, you see, you see this, this is starting to make sense. And what I like about him is he's got a very set idea of, of how he wants to do it in Russia. It may blow up in his face. England may get there and, 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 and it's another tournament where they just fall well short of expectation. Although I don't think expectations are that high. <laughs> but at least Southgate can go there and think, I've done it the way I wanted to do it and if it doesn't work, it's on me. But, but I'm doing things exactly the way I want to do them and I'm bringing in these players. Um, you know, the, the worrying thing about Loftus-Cheek is he's only played 12 top flight games in his whole career and yet suddenly we think he's the answer. But then when we've been sitting watching England as we have for the last however long and we're looking at Dyer and, and Henderson, we're thinking this is so stagnant and, and uninspiring. And then this kid comes along and he, he impresses. I, I watched him, uh, Roy Hodgson's first game when Palace played Southampton, you know, a team under massive pressure, you know, the worst start in history. And yet the lad is out there and he's just trying stuff. And you, you've, you've got to admire it. Mm. We want players, of course, we want young players to, to come through and be heroes in our national team. But I guess you see it all the time, Natalie, with young players coming through into the Brazilian team. Is it just accepted in the country or do we cover them or do you guys cover them in the same way that, that we do and, and hope that they go on to be world beaters? Do yeah. they live with the same pressure? Yes, no, they live with a lot of pressure and I think it's the, the feeling that they bring uh, to the team. Uh, I've worked in a few uh, England matches uh, since I started uh, working here and the difference was uh, I interviewed Tammy Abraham and Loftus-Cheek after the match and they were glowing, they were so happy to be there, they were so excited and I think that's really important for the team. I think uh, when you see uh, this passion uh, that was kind of lacking uh, in other moments. Of course, it's different to face Slovenia and be super motiv motivated, but uh, there was uh, a few times uh, this lack of attitude, really struggling on the pitch and putting everything there. And w when you have young kids, uh, it's different. They, they bring this, uh, they add this to the team, and I think that's really important. I've interviewed um, some fans a few times and uh, during the qualifiers, and they always mention that it's not about only qualifying. They wanted to see something different, and I think that's uh, the main point. And credit to Southgate, because it's less than a year to, to the World Cup, and he's presenting new ideas, mm. so that's really bold. Do you, do you see different... Are the pressures the same, exactly the same though with the Brazilian with the Brazilian national team and the England team? The history is very different, of course. We know we know yeah. of course, Brazil's history with the World Cup, for example. But do they operate under different pressures, or are they exactly the same? No, I think they operate in different pressures. Uh, I always say that Brazilians, especially uh, when we're around the Olympic Games, I always say that Brazilians they don't like sports; they like to win. Brazilian fans mm -hmm. and it's a very cultural thing this winning uh, if they don't win the World Cup it's been five times okay so slow down yeah. it's okay to be fourth you know but they are never satisfied so Brazilians they have to live uh, the Brazilian players even the younger ones they have to live under this kind of pressure uh, Neymar is the biggest example mm -hmm. I mean since he was 14 he was uh, topic he was had. I, I interviewed him for the first time when he was 14 and he was uh, already being uh, chased by Real Madrid and Barcelona so uh, they come uh, under this great amount of pressure uh, since always mm -hmm. and yeah it's kind of different because of the expectations there's always really high expectations for yeah. the Brazilian players always. Okay we'll get more onto Brazil and how they've uh, recovered from the um, World Cup in 2014 in Brazil um, in part two of the program. Sam, I want to go talk, talk about the young players that, that Gareth Southgate has brought into the squad um, for, the, for the Brazil game. Is this a good idea? Natalie mentions the pressure that players have to live under and they exist under. These are guys with a handful of appearances between them. Yeah, and, and they're, not, um, you know, they're, not, they're not playing that much, in, in, well, in, in Gunn's case, not at all. Yeah. I mean, in the Premier League. So... Um, Lewis Cook was captain of the under-20s team that yep. won the World Cup. I mean, he's not really played that much for, for Bournemouth this season. Um, Solanke's made, you know, that bold move to Liverpool and 
He's got a few games coming off the bench mainly, and 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 Angus Khan. I think he's on loan at Norwich, yeah. isn't he, at the moment? Yes. So, um, following in his dad's footsteps, I think I think it's um, it, it, Southgate started at the FA as a kind, as a sort of de facto technical director, didn't he? And then he went on to manage the under 21s, and now he's senior manager. And I think what you're seeing is is this determination that if even if English clubs are not going to pick English players then the FA is going to progress them as quickly as they can if they do well for the junior age group teams and and all three of these players have done really well I mean they they're the you know they're the kind of players that they they're there at every camp their they're, they're appearance records they're in in the case of Solanke he scores a lot of goals for the junior teams so I think it's absolutely right it's an interesting debate that for example Cook has been picked ahead of Jack Wilshere who's fit and and that's another big decision from Southgate I mean he he spoke about Wilshire um, uh, briefly I think just before the Germany game didn't he when he said that he was he was because of all the coverage that it's got that he's going to have to have a conversation with him but I, I, I he's not going back to the same old players you know Daniel Sturridge is not getting a call up he's 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 very much putting the accent on on young players and um, it's bold whether it, again whether it works or not is another matter but it it it's certainly it's certainly a new era it's something very different we haven't seen it before mm. um that point on jack wilshire charlie white in the sun this morning says jack, it's, it's unfathomable that wilshire isn't in that side but have we moved on is it is it got to that point now with jack wilshire where okay look you've had your chance you're not in the arsenal first team in the premier league too many injuries too many issues over the years that's the end yeah and i you know does you, it feel that way it does because I think Southgate referenced it, um, I can't remember whether it was in this week's press conference or last week's press conference, but he did talk about his fragility. And you're talking about tournament football and the demands of tournament football and you're talking about with the warm-up games as well, you, you might be... I know England have this habit of late of being out after about eight days, but uh, if, if they are reasonably successful, you might be playing five, six games in, in, a, in a very short space of time at the end of a season. And I think he looks at Wilshire and he looks at Sturridge as well as just being too fragile for, mm -hmm. for, for tournament demands. It's a great shame because, for me, he's still the most talented English midfielder in the country. Um, and if he was the Jack Wilshire that we, we, that we were watching a couple of years ago, that we, you know, we were talking about him being the one English player that could play in the Barcelona team, um, then you'd have him in, but he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't trust his physical durability. Hmm. OK. Um, do we trust this man's physical durability? Uh, Danny Drinkwater, uh, England's snub fury, he's not happy with the interpretation, according to Steve Stammers, of the stories um, about the reasons why he's not in this, this England squad. What's your interpretation, Nassie? Because Gareth Southgate did have a conversation with him. He did play against Manchester United for 11 minutes last Sunday. Um, the club, his club Chelsea now say he's got a bit of a calf injury, so that's why he couldn't uh, join up. And Gareth Southgate did say, he did say, he's not ready, he's not fit, he's not joining up. Yes, and it was a very straightforward. Uh, uh, Southgate defending, uh, like st sticking up with uh, drink, uh, with drink water. Uh, it's always a delicate matter when we talk about uh, players uh, refusing to be with the national team. It's always a delicate topic. But uh, I think every decision uh, was really straightforward. So uh, maybe it's getting a little bit out of proportion because it's okay with Southgate and drink water. Is, he's not fit. Uh, if you if you see him on the pitch and he played a few minutes for Chelsea, he's clearly not fit. So he's fit enough to play for 11 minutes. Yes, yes, he is fit enough. Maybe I think the most controversial thing is that sometimes it's good for the player just to leave the environment of the national team. Uh, so I think that's the point. But or the mistake. Yes. Perhaps. Yes, or perhaps the mistake. Maybe he should be there. But I think it's hard to judge because uh, physical issues are, are always very controversial, very mm -hmm. delicate. You know, I'm not a doctor, no, none of us are doctors, but we've seen him on pitch. So, yeah, I understand why fans would be upset, but uh, Southgate is trying to deal with it mm. in, I think, in I the think best the way possible. The curious thing about it is that the way, the way things panned out on Thursday was that Southgate told us that he had asked him and he said he wasn't... Um, he, he had told Southgate he wasn't ready. An hour later, Chelsea starts saying that he's still got a calf injury. 
you would think, if that was the case, that Southgate would have said he had a calf injury when he talked about it. So the England manager hasn't been told he's got a calf injury, but Chelsea are saying he's got a calf injury. So there's something deeply suspicious about it to me that, you know, surely that would be given as a reason. The reason that Gareth Southgate was given was simply that he didn't feel ready because he hadn't played enough football. And at the same time, we've heard for some time about Danny Drinkwater that there isn't a great appetite to play for England. It, this is, you know, people at Leicester have said this, and, and he's not being clear on it. His representatives are saying it's not the case. And it's a difficult one from a newspaper perspective, and perhaps people need to understand this, because if you were to write that he doesn't want to play for England, and then he gets the call, and out of pure bloody-mindedness, he, <coughs> he might then accept that call. And then as a newspaper, as a journalist, you, you've got a problem. Mm. Uh, you know, you've actually got a, a, a libel issue. But, you know, the fact, the, that, the, 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 the fact <laughs> of the matter is, well, <laughs> touch wood, 25 years, haven't been too many. <laughs> but, but, um, but that's the issue. But, but, but I come back to the original point, which is Gareth Southgate never mentioned a calf injury. Never mentioned it. Yeah, the, the, I mean, there's, it, Does he fancy it so much? It's fair enough to ask the question because it's been very strange. I mean, he's, he's been the key midfielder you know, for a team that were the champions of England and, and it's been injury after injury. And, and he could argue, well, look, Harry Kane's not in this squad, but he's probably going to play in Tottenham's next game. Well, yeah, because Harry Kane's you know, turned up time after time. And I think it, the strange thing about... about international duty is that we always know that there are some players that just don't want to do it but they a lot of them find it very very hard to come out and say that mm. and it's kind of it's it's sort of almost like it's a bit of a taboo I don't think it should be I think if you, if you don't want to that's fine you know it's a free country and you do what you want to do and it doesn't doesn't make you a bad person but I've, I have to say that the number of pullouts at least he must realise that journalists are going to ask the question. I'm going to say, well, what's going on here? Because he, he could have turned up, he, he could have reported, and he has played for Chelsea. So mm. I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see there's much reason for him to be furious about anything. Yeah. It's not as though he's battle weary, though, is it? Either as, as an exactly. player. It's not like he's Stephen Gerrard or Lampard or Rooney over the uh, 10 years of international mm. service. And he's barely played this season as well. Exactly. Yeah. So. And you'd also yeah. think if you really did have ambitions to try and get on that plane to Russia, you'd be thinking, I need to turn up for this, because I haven't been around for ages. Yeah. I'd need to turn up. And, yeah. and I actually think it's, it is a free country, Sam's right, but I also think it's a sad indictment of, of where we are, that people actually... You know, you, you like to think that every kid that's kicking a football around the playground wants to play, grow up and play for England, but these days we do get players that don't appear to... Don't, aren't interested, and I find mm. that quite sad, from, yeah, think, purely from a sporting fans, perspective. Fans, exactly. Uh, I think fans are, are very uh, upset with that. I've heard a few times that players don't seem uh, excited enough to be on the national team because they are already playing the most prestigious league in mm -hmm. the world. So that's tough, you know. That's tough for, for, for people who, who like to, to support their national team. Can, can you imagine your, your team, uh, the team you've been supporting your whole life? Oh, I'm not that passionate about. Mm -hmm. Are there any playing? famous Brazilians that have refused to play for Brazil? Oh, maybe? it's always a big issue. Uh, I, I remember recently, Neymar uh, wasn't called for uh, from Titi because of the uh, because he he hasn't he, he didn't have vacation. Uh, he he was playing like for one year and the Olympics and yeah. everything. So, but uh, it, it it came from Titi. It's okay mm. that he's not playing. So I think it he had like this protection from his mm. coach, which was good. But it's always an issue in Brazil as well. Yeah. Okay, well, hopefully we'll see Neymar on uh, Tuesday night in a Brazil shirt um, against England at, uh, <laughs> at sure. Wembley. Next up, we're going to talk about the boys from Brazil because they're in town on Tuesday night. OK, England do play Brazil on uh, Tuesday night. There's lots of experts uh, in the papers this morning. Uh, Chi Chi Spark uh, for Brazil's revival. That's Jim Holden this morning in the Sunday Express. Another expert is on the table this morning. That's Sam Wallace <laughs> uh, talking about uh, the venal and corrupt administrators uh, in Brazil. We'll talk to Sam about that in a moment. But uh, first, I want to talk about the revival of the football team because the last time I saw them play live, Natalie, they were beaten 7-1 by yeah. Germany in Hammer. the World Cup in 20... Yeah, Completely. sorry. <laughs> I, apologies, I had to remind <laughs> you. Oh, apologies for reminding you. Um, but uh, that was an, 
a complete and utter humiliation. Of course, Neymar wasn't on the pitch that night because yes. he had his um, damaged back, didn't he? Yes, precisely. What, what's happened since that result? What, what did the Brazil, the, the National Federation, do to change the course and the destiny of the team? Yeah, a lot has happened. It's interesting what's happening uh, with uh, the Brazilians and their national team because there's a reconciliation process now. People are getting back to being excited about the national team, which is good because the national team represents a lot. Uh, for, for all Brazilians, really. And a lot has happened, um, starting with the FIFA scandal. It was really of an, uh, an impact, and that touches on, on your article, Sam, because uh, some changes had to be made. Uh, not ideal changes, because today our, our president, the president of our confederation, can't leave the country, otherwise mm. he will be in jail. Yep. Or, uh, well, risks, but, it certainly risks it, yeah. Yes, exactly. So people were really uh, tired of seeing so many, uh, so many, th there was bad management, poor management on the confederations. And uh, after the 7-1, people just had enough. So Chichi was a huge part of, uh, of all these changes because he's a very trustworthy guy. You know, everybody knows that he's honest and he's very charismatic and people just like him. Recently, there was a pool. Uh, and 50%, 15% of the people who were interviewed said that they would actually vote for him as president of our country. <laughs> so that's how much people like him. Uh, and and uh, it's very important for him to uh, change this relationship that people, uh, that Brazilians have with their national team, get them closer. And uh, they've had some structural changes. Titi put up a very good staff to work with him and concerning uh, politics, he has autonomy, which is very important. So people uh, today, they can separate TT from uh, the people who are in charge of the confederation. That m really makes a difference because on the past years, uh, the other head coaches, they had a close relationship. Mm -hmm. And everybody questioned that actually because when TT uh, got his, uh, was appointed as head coach, uh, everybody remembered that six months before that, he had signed a letter uh, requesting changes on the confederation and requesting uh, Marco Polo Del Nero, which is the president, to pull off. So everybody was kind of just trying to figure out how that would work, how mm -hmm. he would work with those people. Of course, Chichi is a very, very nice and respectful uh, person, so he has a very respectful uh, position uh, in relation to the people who are above him but he has autonomy and people trust him and the players really back him up. He, he has a very close, he has this thing about really getting the players, buying his ideas and he earned the respect with everything that he has done uh, in, in Corinthians. Uh, he was the head coach of Corinthians and he won everything there. And then he just decided to take a sabbatical year mm. because he wanted to study, because he wanted to be better. And he keeps impressing people uh, because he's a very humble guy. He's not like media superstar. And uh, actually, w when he took a sabbatical year, uh, he spoke with a lot of coaches all around the world. And he really liked Ancelotti, Carlo Ancelotti, because uh, he could relate with his style, more discreet, more low profile. And that's GT. He's, he's not a superstar, but he's very effective. And people like him and people buy yeah. what, what he's doing. I think he spent a bit of time at Arsenal. They probably want him as their manager as well. The way he's going. <laughs> um, Matt, you've seen Brazil a number of times over the years. Do you, we always associate them with, with flair, passion, ability. Um, and the ability to, to surprise. Is that what you want to see? Is that, is that what you demand from a Brazilian side, given their history? I think the people that are paying to watch the game on Tuesday night will hope to see that. Yeah, we do. And, and um, you know, I, I, was, I was there in 2002 when, you know, this amazing, amazing team, the three R's, and, you know, the, 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 and they just keep producing these players. And Neymar is now this, the superstar. I, I do, I, I was asking Natalie before the, for the program it is there because it, in those days there were always a sprinkling of superstars in the Brazil team and and it was like they could share the burden together Rivaldo, Ronaldinho, um, Ronaldo whereas it does seem to me certainly from an outsider's perspective that there's an enormous amount of pressure on Neymar like the, you know this week we've been 
reading about him breaking down in tears in a press no, actually, conference. Can I, can I, sorry, Matt, can I just stop you there? Because you told me about the pronunciation of Chichi, the Brazilian coach earlier. I think, <laughs> could you just put him right on Ronaldinho's pronunciation and Ronaldo? <laughs> no. Ronaldo, Ronaldinho. Oh, oh yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> if we sorry, said, if, if we said, if you said, so hard. Go ahead. That so hard. I've never, ever heard anybody outside of Brazil. You said I wasn't allowed to anglicise uh, Natalie's, Natalie's name, for instance, the Brazilian coach. Okay, all right. It's so it's homogeneous. It's, it's very difficult to argue this one with Natalie sitting here, isn't it, really? But he always anyway. gets the pronunciation of Poulis right there, you can't see. It. I, I'm loving I'm not sure the that was right. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> making, I'm yeah. loving the effort. We're all on message yeah. this morning. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, so it, it, it seems like there's an enormous amount of focus on, on, on him. Um, you know, as I say, in 2014, he missed the game and, and, and they, they had that disastrous result. I regretfully didn't go to the final during the Olympics. Um, obviously, it's a multi-sport event. I was in a different part of the city. I didn't get there. I, I do regret it. And seeing him there and how much that meant, that kind of redemption, um, and what it meant to him and what it meant to the country. So I, I think that's the thing. I, I, th I think they are every bit as fanatical as the English when it comes to their national team. And, and they too expect their team to play with flair and, and um, excitement. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. With um, one of the players up front is, of course, um, Neymar, the superstar Sam. Um, some stories this week about him being unhappy at, uh, at Paris Saint-Germain, um, wistfully longing for his life back in Barcelona, or perhaps uh, stories elsewhere linking him with, with Real Madrid. On the surface, on the face of it, do you think it was a mistake for him to move? Um, I, I mean, look, I just struggle with anyone wanting to leave Barcelona when they're part of one of the greatest attacking forces f the f football's ever seen. I don't see why you wouldn't want to play with Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez and why you wouldn't want to play at the new Camp every week. I, I get that the French League's improved and... I'm I, trying to align this with your Danny Drinkwater England argument. Yeah, I... I, th I it's probably a bit different, isn't I, it? it? I just... I, I th there's no question that that move was about money. I mean, I, I mean, I was there. The, I was in Paris when it, for his arrival press conference, and it just seemed to me that, that your instincts about these things, although everyone is trying to convince you in that room, otherwise it's about ambition, it's about this wonderful project, and it's about being the first Champions League winner at Paris Saint Germain. Like, it was about money, and I, it's interesting when you take these superstar footballers. I mean, there's no one bigger really other, other than Messi and Ronaldo than Neymar, and when he walked into the room. His entourage must have been. I mean, the amount of people. Well, they had to he, clear people at the front. Yes, didn't they? you remember that. Yeah. So they were the first two rows were literally his entourage. He was like mm -hmm. those great heavyweight boxers of the 60s and 70s who used to take, you know, just. I mean, literally 30 people with him, shaking mm -hmm. his hand, slapping his back, and 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 it just struck well, me. All that his friends were lined up at the side. They were, as well, yeah. Weren't they? So it, it wasn't was like, just the front. It wasn't just the front. And then they sat down the to watch. Yes. They sat in the front rows, and I just it just struck me then because one thing that people in football always tell me when we talk about the money that players earn and the lives they have, they say, a lot of them say, you won't believe how many other people's wages they're paying. Yes. You know, you won't believe... Yeah. And I'm not just talking about Neymar, I'm talking about footballers generally. Dad gives up work, yeah. brother gives up work. This is the Whitney Houston phenomenon, isn't well, it? Well, you, yeah. you're supporting, like, a mini-community. And, and it was just a little insight into the life of this guy that you, you, know, that you only ever see for two seconds in a mix zone or... You know, you watch him. You watch him walk out to warm up with his teammates. It was just an insight into his life, and yeah, I think it. I think it does come down to money. I think I, I, I just feel that Barcelona are one of the you know the great clubs. Paris Saint Germain aren't. I, I mm. you know, I'm, and I don't see why you would leave when you are capable when you are playing in a team that history will remember as one of the greatest mm. so that's my, that's my thoughts i'm sure he couldn't care less neymar but um <laughs> but i he's in the country i, I think i think the, the the validity of this story which he has denied is that um nasty will probably put me right on this wasn't it broken by the the same brazilian reporter that broke the initial story that he was yes. leaving but so he's yes. he's got a lot of credibility this guy mm -hmm. yes marcelo marcelo beckler yes he does so, yeah Yes, but uh, in L'Equipe, a uh, very prestigious French newspaper, uh, re-endorsed it, saying that uh, although he denied he is unhappy in PSG, and Neymar just said, please stop making up stories yeah. uh, regarding me and PSG. I have a great relationship with, uh, with my coach, with Cavani. So 
there is a lot of pressure uh, surrounding Neymar right now. The, the thing that strikes me the most is that uh, I followed him uh, on Santos and obviously everybody uh, saw him on Barcelona. And he always was the kind of guy who really gets along with everyone. He, he likes to be surrounded with lots of people, as you saw <laughs> in his uh, first day in PSG. Uh, this is very common, actually. Uh, Brazilians, they, they bring uh, friends to live with them because uh, it, it keeps them company and it, and it keeps them grounded. So What's not common now, is he keeps missing... Every, every year when it's his sister's birthday, <laughs> he's injured or suspended, isn't he? He always, misses, he always seems to miss the game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, don't know what, I don't know what that's all about. You're putting Nessie on the spot here. Yeah, you know, yeah. She's got to interview him. I know, I'm sorry. Were, you, were, you, were you living in Brazil when, when he was first coming through, when he was at Santos? Yes, yes, okay. I was. So I was. Was, he, was it obvious then that he was of superstar quality, that he was going to go on to one of the top players in the world? Was yes. it that obvious? Yes. Uh, at the age of 14, he was already a star. Everybody was watching him. So when he made his debut uh, in, in, as a professional, Everybody was watching. There was always these high expectations, and he always managed to pull it off. Uh, he always dealt really well with the pressure, and uh, I think he's been dealing with pressure for over 10 years. And I think now maybe it's it's getting to that limit. You know, you're the most expensive player in the history of football, and you have this responsibility of. Uh, taking PSG to winning the, the Champions League. At the same time, you have to be humble and nice to everybody. So I think he's having a hard time re reconciliating everything. Uh, he's 25. So, yeah, it's hard. But the thing about him uh, leaving Barcelona to PSG, at first, really, I, I, I couldn't understand as well. But I don't know, maybe at the end of the season, uh, PSG will win the Champions League with him scoring at the final and everybody's going to say, wow, what a great idea PSG had <laughs> yeah. signing Neymar. But if that doesn't happen, it's going to be a complete failure. So that's a different uh, spot to be on. Either you're like a hero and bold decision. You left Barcelona and now you're about to be the best player in the world or come on, man, what did you do here? <laughs> Why did you leave Barcelona? There's, there, there's no middle balance. Ground. Yes, there's mm. no middle ground. In terms of popularity and pedigree, where does he rank in all-time top Brazilian footballers? Mm. That's a tough question because I think today he's, uh, he's more popular. He, he had like these ups and downs because as a young kid, uh, Chichi mentioned that, he makes mistakes. He uh, and every everything that he does is blown out of proportion. So I think he's still building up. Like if we compare him to Ronaldo, for for an instance, uh, Ronaldo. The same as, that was the same as me. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> She's anglicising it to help you. I'm, 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 so you can understand. I'm, I'm trying to feel like a part of it. So uh, if you compare with with Ronaldo Fenomeno, and it, it's different because he won the World Cup and he has like this beautiful history of overcoming challenges and injuries and everything. So maybe, for sure, Neymar isn't there yet. Okay. But in a few years, perhaps, it depends on what is, is he going to add to the national team's history. He seems very happy to be there, and I think that's, that's really important. People like him, uh, the players like him, the coach likes him. Uh, he burst into tears uh, recently because... Uh, Chichi was uh, saying these great things about him and his character and that people are allowed to make mistakes. Were and they genuine? Do you think they were genuine? I think, I think, I, I like I to believe so. I know you sighed so. at me, but I, I, I gotta, I've got to ask. I like to believe so, because I, I, I don't want to think that someone would fake tears just to get sympathy of journalists. And I, I like to think that they are sincere. And I've, I've never had anything... Uh, any, uh, every time that I've been to Neymar, I, I, I've been with Neymar, he was always like a kid, like a nice kid, you know? So I think there's still this side of him that's just mm. a nice kid who, do, who does uh, what he likes. And I yeah. think the Brazilians 
really like to believe on yeah. that side. OK. Well, we look forward to seeing them in action, hopefully, on uh, Tuesday night in the Brazil show when they play England at uh, Wembley Stadium. OK, next up, uh, you must be looking forward to the next party. Obviously, I'm ready. <laughs> he's ready, he's raring to go. <laughs> Matt Lawton on David Moyes, new West Ham manager. That's coming next. Uh, welcome back with us this morning, Sam Wallace uh, from The Telegraph, Natalie Jedra is a Brazilian reporter and uh, Sam, uh, Matt Lawton rather uh, from The Mail. Let's have a reminder of what's in the papers this morning, back page of the Sunday Express. Lothar Mateus, World Cup winner himself with Germany, he said England scare us after that nil-nil draw um, on Friday night at Wembley Stadium. Uh, is this man scaring us? Danny Drinkwater, England snub fury, is not happy um, with the interpretation of events. Uh, leading to his decision not to join up with the England squad. That's Steve Stammers this morning in the mirror. Uh, bring on the boys from Brazil. That's Tuesday night's game. Neymar and co are in town for that game. A more sobering story in the uh, mail on Sunday. That's Adam Crafton reporting from uh, Shappi. Shappi Cohen, the Shappi Coenzi uh, tragedy um, was a year ago. Um, what, why did I get to, the, to live? Uh, when some of my friends died. We'll talk to Natalie about that in part five of today's programme. We're coming on to this man right now, though, and he is smiling. It's David Moyes. He's back in business and back in business with West Ham, certainly until the end of the season. Uh, Matt, um, does he deserve, does he merit another chance at the highest level of the game? Um, just about, yeah. I think, um, you know, it hasn't gone well for him since he left Everton. Um, I think... I don't think there's any manager that would have actually made United work in the immediate, um, as, as the immediate successor to Ferguson, as we saw Van Gaal struggled as well. So I think it's harsh to judge him too much on what happened at United, but I think United was such a chastening experience that I then think he perhaps didn't make the best choices after that. I think Real Sociedad was a mistake. He, he might argue with that, but um, I don't think there was enough due diligence done on that. He didn't to me, he didn't really want to be there. Uh, and then Sunderland, the curious thing about taking the Sunderland job was, I know he looked at it when he was at Sociedad and he sent one of his sort of tried and sort of trusted scouts to go and have a look at them. And, and the report back was, they are, they're, they're just not good enough. There's not enough quality in the squad. Don't go near the place. But then he's out of work. And, and there's this, often this thing with managers. And you do have to be careful because there are lots of examples of managers that have stayed out too long and then they just don't get back. So I think there was a, a degree of panic in taking the Sunderland job and within five minutes he knew he'd made a mistake. Right? He just knew that he, he, uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't do much with the players he had and, and Ellis Short said there's no money. The, the trouble was I think what was slightly worrying about the Sunderland experience and I interviewed him um, a couple of months ago after he left Sunderland was that he, he admitted that the, the, the methods, the techniques, the management techniques that he's employed throughout his career just weren't working. And, it, and, and I thought it was quite a big admission that. He just basically said, the stuff, that, the stuff that I know works with footballers just isn't working anymore with these guys. So they, they've, you know, they've hired him. It was very obvious in the West Ham uh, statement. They've hired him for what he did at Everton. And they're hoping that he can rediscover that kind of authority and, and leadership. Um, but I think it's, a, you know... Has it in, Matt, you've known him a long time. Yeah. Has he, has he changed, has he noticeably changed in terms of his character and his approach to the game? He's still got great self-belief, but, um, you know, uh, I thought he was a shadow of himself immediately after he left United. I, I, you know, I did that first interview with him and this extraordinary uh, story that he told about knowing that he was going to get sacked that day, uh, going into the training ground at five o'clock in the morning so that he beat the, even, even the keenest photographer, he beat them into to Carrington. And then he basically knew that he had hours to kill at Carrington and he went for a run around the pitches on his own in the dark and it was this incredible image of it. It was like the start of a film, the way he was describing it. And and I think he was he's he I I felt I did feel like I was talking to a, a slightly broken man at that point. Um, but the man I met a couple of months ago post Sunderland did seem stronger, more together. He could sort of rationalise it quite well. Um, so I think he believes he can do it. 
Uh, I worry for him a bit. I thought Matt Dickinson wrote a great piece in the Times on Friday about the sort of the madness of West Ham working for this triumvirate. Um, then, then, then they've been together a long time, Karen Brady, David Sullivan, and David Gold. But they always, it's a, and, and they clearly get on, and they clearly have have a way of working together. But it never seems quite like they're all quite in sync with each other. And 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 I always think there's there's far too much said in public. I think Sullivan says far too much when a manager is still in office. Um, Lots of blame being passed around for signings. We're, Tony Henry, the director of football, never seems to get a mention. Um, and yet, I think he isn't either sort of head of recruitment. I thought he was. Um, so, you know, you fear for him a little bit. It should be a good job. It's one of the big jobs. Great stadium. I know they don't like it there, but it's a big modern stadium. It, you know, it should be. It should be a good move for him. Mm. Sam, um, <clears throat> I think. The sort of the fall of Moyes, if you can call it that, post Everton has been a very sort of a singularly kind of modern humiliation of a manager. I mean, you only have to look at the way he's. It, it, that, that's what I, f I feel saddest about is that people tend to seek to humiliate him, and there's you only have to look at you know Twitter on on a, on a day when one of his teams is losing, and so and I, and I think that underplays what he achieved at Everton over 11 years, where he really. He, he had no big name from his playing career. He'd never managed in the top flight before. Those kind of appointments don't happen anymore, you know, going from Preston North End to Everton. And he really made a success of that. I thought he made some really bad mistakes at Sunderland. You know, talk about the way he spoke to that BBC report, that mm. female BBC reporter. That doesn't... He, he always just... Uh, you know, I feel, feel he's a good man, and, and, and that wasn't a good thing to do. And also, I just felt he was... He was just too negative about the club. I mean, Matt's a, Matt obviously knows him well and says that he thought, you know, just weeks in, I've made a mistake here. That wasn't hard to tell when you were, when, when you, on the few times I heard him speak. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I disagree a bit with Matt about United. I think they were the champions when he was given them. I know it wasn't a great squad, but I think it, he, he should yeah, come back. I wouldn't disagree. So, um, I, I want, you know, I, of course, I, I would like to see him do well. One, one thing that really struck me this week was um, uh, Rory Smith wrote a piece in the New York Times about British managers, a certain generation of British managers, and how many jobs they've got. And I, I just, I'll just read you this stat because it really st stuck with me. But David Moyes, Mark Hughes, Roy Hodgson, and Sam Allardyce have had 25 Premier League jobs between. Them. <laughs> I mean, that that is, you know, that is quite. Oh, sorry, 25 jobs between them. I mean, that is quite staggering and um, and Rory's thesis was that actually it's it's not foreign managers that are holding back young British coaches it's old British coaches and I and, and I do it's wonder being recycled I do wonder there will be a lot of young British coaches thinking I would like to manage West Ham you know I I would like to be the, the man plucked from the championship as David Moyes was in 2002 and go and manage a great English football club and um, they're not getting that chance because there does tend to be this sort of sort of churn of the same faces in, in different jobs. But, uh, you know, I, I, I do go back, I go, I'll finish by going back to his 11 years at Everton. We, we did a thing, uh, the Telegraph, we did a thing called, uh, we do it every year called, well, we do it every now and again, Modern Heroes, um, which is the one person at your club in the last 20 years, or the one person at each club in the Premier League and the Championship who's made a big difference and it can be a player it can be a chairman, an owner, or a manager. And uh, Everton was Moyes, yeah. you know, because he, he really took them from a club that were fighting relegation to, to finishing fourth one season. So that should always be, that it should always be borne in mind. Yeah. Natty, Sam um, mentioned um, last season that uh, rather unsavoury incident that uh, Dave Moyes had. It came to light with a female BBC um, reporter. Um, he, did he has apologised for it. Of course, it's been he's been reminded of it. Yes. Um, this week. Um, what are your feelings towards it and the decision of West Ham to employ David Moyes? Yeah, at that moment, I think it, I've never uh, met him mm -hmm. to, to say, oh, he's a nice guy or he's just like that. But uh, I think at that point, it was just poorly put. You know, it was a mistake and he clearly regretted it. And he, he, he got really criticized by that. He 
with reasons, uh, like they, they had every reason to criticize because it was very unfriendly. So I wouldn't like you, it. Yeah, but I you seem like to accept it. that in uh, heat of the moment that he said that he said something that was un that's clearly socially unacceptable and unacceptable to the person involved. I wouldn't like to, to hear that comment and I would be very uncomfortable with it. I, I, I wouldn't know what to do or what to say or if I would reply, what do you mean by that? What are you saying? But it, it was unfortunate and it happened and I think it's it's on the past and it's gonna be interesting because I think uh, he had a very tough path Man United Real Sociedad and then uh, Sutherland and now uh, West Ham he has a point to prove West Ham has a point to prove after all the signings so when you put everything together I think it's gonna be interesting to see and uh, and I think he has to relate with the fans uh, a little bit more uh, especially uh, when he's giving press conferences, he, mm. the fans are really needy of more spirit because they have great signings, they have great players. Uh, he said something interesting about uh, starting with defense and then building up a real style of play, but uh, the fans seem to be really eagering that. Yeah. that that they want, will, yes. Yeah, they want a fresh start, and they've got one with yeah. uh, David Moyes as the new manager at uh, West Ham's first game next weekend against Watford. OK, next up, we're going to talk about Michael Emanalo. He left Chelsea earlier on in this week. What is his legacy? More on that next. OK, more domestic matters now. We're going to talk about Michael Emanalo at uh, Chelsea. He's just left the job after 10 years, Sam. Um, someone that you wrote about several times, and, and you wrote about him um, this week. Um, what was his what was his effect on that football club? Um, well, he his main responsibility. I mean, he he was uh, um, over, helped overhaul or, or carry on the work that Frank Arneson and Neil Barth, had, alongside Neil Barth, the academy director, with with developing the young players. That meant making sure that Chelsea had the best young players in London and, and that area, which has been borne out by their phenomenal results. And also, he was part of the uh, of Chelsea's recruitment. Um, so over the years, you know, he would have had a lot of input. It was often him who was sort of would be shaking hands and handing the shirt over to the new signing. Um, it, it's not easy, Chelsea. It's not. It, I think the, the the simplest way it's ever been explained to me is it's not really a management hierarchy. It's a management plateau, mm. and under Abramovich, obviously, who is the, the big boss, and uh, and everyone does sort of does their own thing and and works on their own projects and tries to bring in the players that they hope will make the team better and of, of course there's there's decisions there's collective decisions but but it they do tend to work in silos so he was part of that um, I, th I think people when they think about Chelsea's recruitment and we've both written about it a lot over the last 10, 10 12 years they kind of think of lots of young foreign players being bought in for a fortune and then shipped out and not not doing what they were expected to do actually that has happened in the past, but now they have refined it to the stage where Tammy Abraham, uh, Ruben Loftus-Cheek, Dominic Solanke, even Jack Cork's a Chelsea boy originally, and, and, and I'm missing people out there, there's, there's, there's others that I should have mentioned. It, it has become, they win FA Youth Cup after FA Youth Cup, and a lot of that is Neil Barth as well as Michael Emanalo. But they also have the loan system, which again is pretty infamous, 40-odd players out on loan, but it works for them. It really does work for them, and these players are earning them a lot of money in transfer fees, even if they don't go on to play for Chelsea. And I think one thing I, I've interviewed Michael Emanalo once, and the one thing I would really say for him is that he did care about these boys. He desperately wanted to see uh, young South London boys becoming Chelsea footballers. It's very hard. It's an incredibly high standard to get into that Chelsea team. Um, but I think the irony is, is that a few days after he, he leaves the club. Uh, Tammy Abraham and Ruben Loftus Cheek are named in the England squad. It's 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 kind of a sort of a, a bit of a vindication. Mm. I, I feel really. Um, how, how will Chelsea fans look at his his decade? Because palpable discord mm. is is, yeah. is the phrase that people yeah. will always remember referring to Mourinho being sacked yeah. um, in 2015. Now it's December yes. 2015. Um, that that's the that's the phrase that he'll always be remembered by. But how should Chelsea supporters remember him? Well, it's, a very, it's not a bad way to be remembered, as well. It's a very elegant phrase. I mean, he was sort of pushed out in front of the Chelsea TV cameras to explain the sacking of the club's most popular manager for the second time. And uh, I actually thought he did quite a good job of it. Um, but 
how will they remember him? They'll remember him as someone who was easy to blame when things were going wrong. They, they did a lot of that. Um, and I, I, I'd like to think that actually his legacy will become clearer in the next few years when hopefully some of these young lads... Mm. We've, I mean, there's, there's so many of them. I think Lewis Baker at Middlesbrough, who's on, who's, who would... You know, you've got Ampadu, who's already made his debut, and I know they signed him, but they have to... The one thing about him, if you look at his actual career himself as a player, he was a, a, a talented young Nigerian footballer who played for his country. Actually, towards the end of his career, he played at the 94 World Cup. And I know what you're about to say. But Mark Maradona, out there, people say he, was, he did one of the best jobs ever on Maradona. So he was a good player. His, his CV attracts scorn because he played for Port Vale. And, but actually, I think he was one of those players who if he, it would have benefited from the kind of career plan that Chelsea give young players. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of fans at home will be thinking, I don't want any praise for Chelsea's youth system. They just sign other people's players. They used to do that. Actually, now they develop their own, and they're doing it very, yeah. very well. Will this be good or bad for Antonio Conte? Um, well, it feels like it's what Antonio Conte probably wants. I know that will be denied, but it does seem like there's been some kind of power struggle. Like there's such a secretive club, Chelsea. It's very hard to to get to the bottom of, you know, why Louise was uh -huh. left out the other day, why Amanalo has gone. Um, it's, it's interesting because it, I think he's sort of he's being remembered more fondly now because we can see the fruits of his labour, if you like. But to begin with, he was seen as he had to deal with the fact that Avram Grant had brought him in, so he had to, he, that was held against him. Um, and then he was very much seen as a company man who was thrust onto Ancelotti when Wilkins was Ray Wilkins was was pushed out, and 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 people didn't like that. People because Ancelotti was so popular, people were looking at Emanuel and thinking, well, he's a Bramwich's man, and and it was and Wilkins's departure, as we know, was kind of the beginning of the end for Ancelotti. So he had that to overcome, but. I, I gotta say, I, th I was massively impressed with him at the football writers' dinner when he spoke about Conti, um, and actually spoke to him a little bit that evening. And a very charming man. Um, but as Sam says, he's he's. Well, will Conti miss him? It's it, it, the thing about Chelsea is the man of manager. There's such a turnover of managers. It's more about the club, I think. And mm. and, and he does seem to bring in good players. He does know a, he does know a player, and, yeah. and, he, and he still finds them at a time it's very hard. You know, we talk about Moyes, and there was a period in Moyes' career, particularly at Everton, when he was brilliant at spotting players. You know, he, he would pluck them from the, the lower leagues. Amanalo has had a bit of a knack for doing that in the last few years, of finding these talented young players, even though some of them are now at other clubs, like De Bruyne and people, but he, he finds them and he brings them in. So mm. I think, yeah, the club probably will miss him. Yeah. Matt mentioned uh, David Luiz, left out the squad um, for the game against uh, Manchester United last weekend. What does the future hold for him as a Chelsea player? And also, he's out of Brazil, the national squad as well, yeah. so he's a big miss or he's a, in terms of his profile and his name and his reputation. Um, and he's a guy, of course, who played in that... Sorry to bring it up again, <laughs> but the 7-1. Yes, yes, it happened. We have to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. what, what about his future, though? What's, what's next for him? Yeah, something's not what's right. Going on? Yeah, something's not right in, in Chelsea for sure. Uh, we cover a lot of Chelsea games because uh, in Brazil, the Chelsea, uh, we have a huge f uh, Chelsea fan base. And uh, well, Davi, he's clearly a guy with personality on the pitch. He's never the guy who, uh, after a match, you're, you're gonna say, "Wow, did Davi enter the pitch at all?" No, he's always there. If he makes a mistake, it's because he's there and he's exposing himself, and he's always uh, communicating at the pitch and screaming with other players. And he has personality. So, and Conti has to to deal with that because this is a very <coughs> positive thing, you know. Uh, when things don't go well for Chelsea, he stops at the mix zone and he gives explanations and he talks to every single person who's there. So uh, if you have uh, a player uh, with this uh, personality, with this strong personality, you have to take uh, what's positive uh, of that. And I think Conte is having a problem with, with this and, and I think things really started to go badly for him, for Conte after everything that went on with Diego. Maybe he lost some players at that process because many people liked Diego and didn't like the way that he approached things like laughing in, the, mm -hmm. in his press conference and taking all this, uh, taking actions like this. Uh, but Davi is, isn't, uh, hasn't been called up for the national team. I think it's a bit unfair. Uh, I would consider him, recently he was uh, called up for a friendly match. Uh, 
but uh, especially after uh, everything that he did uh, on the last season, he's been playing really well. But today, Chichi has really good uh, defensive players. He has Thiago Silva, he has Miranda, and he has Marquinhos, who's mm. doing really well at PSG. There's a fourth spot there, and there are some players to be considered. And I think Davi should definitely be mm. considered, not only because he's been playing really well, and what Conte said doesn't make any sense, because like a few months ago, he was saying all these wonderful things about David Luiz, and now he's, he, he doesn't even deserve to be on the, on the, yeah. on the bench. Uh, but I think he deserves to be considered, and uh, he, he's probably going to be back at training uh, this week, uh, ne next week. Sure. Next. Just, just quickly, Natalie, because um, you mentioned that naughty boy, Diego Costa. Uh, yeah. um, how do... Brazilian natives view him for his for switching allegiance from Brazil to Spain. Uh, Marcos Senna, of course, famously did yeah. it as well. Um, and uh, no, but Diego's impact was worse. Right, was worse uh, than Marcos Senna because Diego uh, was popular and he was considered uh, for the national team, and everybody was expecting him to to be on the Brazilian team. And people don't have a nice image of him, which is uh, which I think it's a shame because uh, the first times that I got to interview Diego, I <laughs> I get to I, I got to see he's a great guy and he's very honest. He's he's kind of crazy, but he's like good crazy, you know. Yeah. And uh, but he's uh, he's not very popular with no. Brazilians uh, for that choice, which is a shame. Yeah, you know? it certainly is a shame. Okay, we're going to um, move on to World Cup qualifiers next. We're going to talk about Northern Ireland. They're playing Switzerland and the Republic of Ireland. They drew last night with Denmark 0-0. More on those next. Welcome back. We do say turn your phones off on this program, but of course during the breaks they can't help but look at the Twitter feed. Everyone's, everyone's really enthusiastic about everyone's it. Everyone's of course they're enthusiastic. It's a 100% vote yes. So. <laughs> yeah, fanatic, I think, so far, <laughs> judging by some of the tweets we've just read out. Yeah. Yeah, OK, let's move on to... Uh, yeah, let's get back to business. Uh, Switzerland against Northern Ireland. The first leg, Matt, um, of course, controversial penalty. Yeah. Overshadowed, I think, yeah. by events off the field. Corey Evans' um, wife uh, tweeting yeah. about the Romanian referee. Um, yeah. your, thoughts on, your thoughts on that, please? Uh, astonishing. Um, absolutely astonishing. Like my wife is a reporter mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a massive story over there. Um, she's basically <laughs> there's no excuse for what she said at any point, but the fact that she's actually slept on it, has got up at half past eight in the morning and posted a tweet that is so offensive. Like, there's quite a big Romanian community in in in, in Northern Ireland, and uh, not that that should even be relevant. No, no, but the fact is, it, 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 it it's. Because she makes reference to it, that's why it's relevant. She actually makes reference to his relatives have probably been housed by us. It's so mm. offensive. I, I actually... It's... Without going too much into the politics of Northern Ireland, which I have some insight because of my family connections, it's, it, it will really set back, because there's a real issue in, in, in Northern Ireland, for obvious reasons, in getting the whole country to get behind the national team. And I, I think she's set it back. Uh, by, by, by revealing those kind of uh, racist uh, um, uh, views. And I, I, I do hope, actually, it doesn't simply end with, you know, a statement where she says, I don't condone racism in any form. Yeah, you've been incredibly racist. I don't think you'd say you don't condone racism. I think you revealed yourself to be racist. Mm. So I, you would hope it actually escalates. You would hope there's... that the authorities get involved and that she has to properly answer for that because it's, it was, you know, one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen on Twitter. Um, massively embarrassing to the team, massively embarrassing to Michael O'Neill. Um, you know, if, if, if her husband didn't have enough to, to worry about with the penalty the night before, she, uh, she made it 8,000 times worse. He's suspended, Matt, but should he still be in the squad? He's travelled. Should he have withdrawn from the squad? I think he should, I think he should have done, given, given the circumstances. It's a, you I know what? he should still be in the squad, but... You that's... know what, it's a tricky one, because you can't... As an FA, as a, I remember there was a, there was a situation, and I, I, won't, I won't get into the specifics, but there was a situation with a family men, member in Germany, uh, at the World Cup in Germany with in England. I remember speaking to the FA about it and them saying, we can't, we can't be responsible for the family members who are out here uh, at, at the tournament. Um, that was so, an exchange with you, though, wasn't it? That... Yeah, that was an exchange with me. Yeah, so I had a I had an altercation with uh, with one of the parents of one of the players that objected to something I'd written, um, and it was a bit too aggressive. And and I sort of you know I I went to the FA and said uh, can't really be having this. Um, and uh, I didn't didn't write about it. 
Um, but uh, and that was the response I got. You know, we can't, we can't, we can't be held responsible for the for, for what family members. Are Ten doing. years on, do you wish you had written about it? Mm. Um, would you write about it if it happened to you now? It's still not too late. If it happened to you now, would funny, you write Funny about enough, it? the player wrote about it in his book and it, and it was not an accurate account of what happened. Right, okay. But, um, but uh, you know, at least you, yeah, you, try and be, you, try, you try and be the bigger person about it. But, and yeah, I'm, here I am bringing it up now. But no, it, but it's an example of why I'm not sure, as I say, massively embarrassing for, for Michael O'Neill, massively embarrassing for the team, damaging to the team. But it's his, it's, his, it's his wife and she's done it. If she's over there, she's probably in a different hotel. He's, n he's not going to be with her. He's going to be with the team. She's done it completely off her own bat. And, and yeah, it's astonishing. And as I say, it, it, I can't believe it won't be something that the authorities don't get involved sure. in because it's, it, it's surely a criminal matter. Yeah. OK, big task ahead uh, as well on the field for uh, Northern Ireland in that uh, second leg against Switzerland. Um, you watched the Republic of Ireland last night in the nil-nil draw with Denmark. Is it exactly, is it exactly what you expected from a Marcel O'Neill side away from home in the first leg of, of a... Um, well, it's the, it's the last shot yeah. of getting into the World Cup. Is it, <clears> is it what you expected? It, it, it's, uh, it's obviously a great result if they get through in, in Dublin. Um, yeah. I, it's an interesting one because... I, I was, it was quite a fascinating debate afterwards on Sky with Keith Andrews talking very eloquently about the, the problems that, that, um, only, that Martin O'Neill faces, that he really doesn't have a squad that can play expansive football, yet they're unbeaten to, away from home in yeah. two years. It's an incredible record. I think in, in qualifying, well, Serbia have beaten them, haven't they? But um, uh, they really... Um, I think there's obviously a debate in Ireland that they would like to see a bit more... Uh, but more attractive football, mm -hmm. and and O'Neill has but O'Neill has delivered them within 90 minutes of, of a World Cup finals, which for a nation of that size, given the competitiveness of international football, is incredible. Um, I, I, I suppose the the question is what do they do in Dublin? That that's really going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And the consensus last night was that they are going to have to come out a bit more in attack. Um, when you look at the, it, the Danish, are a relatively modest side, but the, you know they've got Christian Eriksen, who's who's a higher profile mm. than any Irish very footballer. Yeah, and and did, and they really did keep him under lock yeah. and key. Kasper Schmeichel again, higher profile really than any of the Irish lads. So um, Martin O'Neill is is once again managing to, uh, to to produce a side that's greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and I I just fancy them really because I think they. I think that they will. The atmosphere and and the fact that they that, that they know how to get they know how to win these sort of yeah. games. I think they'll do it. Okay, could be one of those famous uh, Dublin nights. We've all had a few of those. Um, Natalie, um, there's a piece in the Mail on Sunday we'd like to talk to you about yes. as well this morning. Um, Adam Crafton uh, has been out to Brazil and has spoken to some of the survivors, um, some of the people involved with um, the football club Chapi um of course, um, who lost so many lives in that air tragedy last season. Could you just give us a little bit of insight into how that tragedy touched that football club? Um, it, was a, it, was, it became a worldwide story. Um, it generated naturally a lot of sympathy um, and a great deal of interest. And the reasons behind that? Yeah, Chapecoense was going through a bit of a fairy tale because they were about to, to, uh, to go to the final of the South American Cup, which is like the equivalent of uh, Euro uh, Europe, um, Europa, Europa League. League. Yeah. So uh, nobody could really believe because Chapecoense is a small club and it wasn't really relevant uh, when you think of such a big country as Brazil. And uh, when that happened... Uh, For example, had you ever been to see them play? Had you ever seen them play? Yes, yes, but only a few times, yeah. But I've never been to Chapeco, to the city. Okay. I've, I've, I've seen them play when they played against big teams. So that says something. And uh, it really touched people because first, uh, it's like an end of a fairy tale, and everybody was really involved with the team by then. It, it was a, a football club that uh, people were uh, sympathizing with their story and their struggle, and uh, 
on the semifinals, uh, the goalkeeper Danilo, he he made like the cru the most crucial save that put the team on the final, and they are even uh, making a film a movie about him. Um, many people from the press know uh, new uh, journalists who were there. I worked with three journalists who were there, so it was very sensitive. For people who were close uh, to anyone who was on, the, on that plane, and for people who just couldn't believe that that was happening to a club at that point, mm. uh, many Brazilians uh, were associate. Uh, they, they became main members of Chapecoense just to help them uh, restructure and rebuild Chapecoense today uh, at the Brazilian National um, Championship is in the middle of the table, which is outstanding for a club that had everything to, you know, fall apart completely. And people just made donations and uh, bought uh, jerseys. Everybody's a bit of a fan of Chapecoense today because of the tragedy and how they are overcoming them themselves. So it was quite a shock. I think everybody remembers what they were doing when they read or heard what happened with Chapecoense. I remember I couldn't believe for like a couple of hours. And the, the news was, they, they were really disconnected. Uh, oh, uh, there weren't survivors. No, there is a survivor. No, no, there isn't mm. anymore. So that was a horrible day for everyone who was following that. And many people uh, went to Chapeco for the funeral, even though uh, you didn't knew anyone. Everybody was so touched with that. Mm. And it was it was really uh, a tragedy, like the biggest tragedy of Brazilian football, for yeah. sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, certainly, if you get a chance today, uh, read Adam Crafton's piece in uh, the Mail on Sunday about uh, the survivors one year on. Okay, let's go back to the game on Tuesday night, Matt. Um, England against Brazil. What uh, what do you, what do you expect? What do you want to see from Gareth Southgate's side against a team that is re-emerging? Um, yeah, I, I hope to see a bit more intensity than because let's be honest. Um, it was a training exercise. Yeah, the Germans, particularly in the second half, they were strolling around, weren't they? Um, because you know, as excited as we are by Loftus Cheek's emergence, he wasn't put under an enormous amount of pressure uh, in midfield. Um, so you would hope that Brazil um, will maybe you know have a, have a bit more of a go than Germany did. Um, and again, because we, we get excited about a performance against Germany, but we got very excited about a performance against Germany in 2001, which is actually in a competitive game, and then you, you fast forward nine months and we're getting knocked out by the three. I'm not going to pronounce their names again, <laughs> but, 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 but we, get, we get eliminated by Brazil and we watch Germany get to the final. You know, it's, 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 you know when it gets to the tournament, the serious business, uh, the Brazils and the Germanys tend to do a bit better than us. Yeah. But uh, no, I just, I just hope we get more of a game. Yeah. OK. So, hope we do see more of a game um, against Brazil on Tuesday night. OK, that's all we've got time for on the Sunday Supplement this morning. Thanks very much uh, to the guys for joining us. As uh, Natalie's on the table, we'll get some uh, score predictions for Tuesday, quickly. I'm going to go for a, a glorious 2-2. Two 2-2? -two. Two -two. I'm going for 3-1 Brazil. Of course you Sorry, are. Sorry, guys. Okay, Matt? 1-1, <laughs> one, one, like Zico and Keegan. 1-1, one, one, OK. I'm going to go 2-0 with England. Uh, they're going to beat the boys from Brazil. OK, thanks very much to the guys um, for joining us this morning. Um, lots of football coming your way. It's all on Sky. AFC Wimbledon against Peterborough. That's from 2 on Sky Sports Football. Switzerland against Northern Ireland. That's 4.30. And then Greece against Croatia. That's 7.40 on Sky Sports Football. OK. Don't forget, you can download the podcast from all the usual places or you can catch up on demand. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks for all your tweets this morning. We'll see you next week. The same time, the same place at 9.30. See you.